So part of the determinant of addiction has to do with how the drug works and how you deliver it to yourself. It turns out that about 40% of the variation in propensity for addiction can be explained by genetics, by what you get from your mother and father. Now, there's no single gene for addiction. There are many different genes for addiction, and there are many that we don't know yet. We don't entire, we're far from understanding this uh, in detail, but by analyzing families and twins and adopted twins, we can come up with this estimate that's pretty good. And this 40% and this holds fairly well over a large number, not all addictions, but over a large number of addictions. So what kind of biological changes would you inherit that would make you more likely to be an addict? Well, you might think, oh, oh, oh I know, right? So an addict, if they say, take a drink of alcohol, if I take an alcohol and I don't have a predisposition for addiction, I take a uh, drink of alcohol, it feels pretty good, but someone else, they take a drink of alcohol, it feels great, and then they're really reinforced and they're likely to do it again. And again, that sounds completely reasonable and it turns out to be 180 degrees wrong. It's not true. It turns out that the genetic variants that predispose you to alcoholism are largely those that turn down the function of the pleasure circuit. And let me explain how that works. So dopamine is very crucial to, dopamine signaling is very crucial to the pleasure circuit. So if you inherit a variant of a dopamine receptor that works less efficiently, then you're gonna get less of a pleasure buzz. So let's say I'm not an addictive personality, I go to the bar, I have two drinks of whiskey, feel a little tipsy, feel good, hang out with my friends and go home. Someone else who carries a genetic variant where their dopamine receptors don't work as well or they don't secrete much dopamine or anything that turns down dopamine signaling within the pleasure circuit, they go to the bar and in order to get to the same set point of pleasure that I got with two drinks, they got to have eight drinks. That is how the genetic predisposition for addiction works. It's blunted pleasure. Now that accounts for 40%. So what accounts for the rest? Well, a lot of it, it turns out, has to do with stress. And you might think, oh, well, stress. We're now in the airy-fairy realm of psychology. He's gotten out of biology. He's talking about stress. No, stress is a biological phenomenon, right? So you have an argument with your sweetheart. You get sacked from your job. You're fighting off an infection. All of those things cause your adrenal glands that sit on top of your kidneys to secrete stress hormones. And those stress hormones pass into your bloodstream and then into your brain. And they bind stress hormone receptors on the surface of neurons within your pleasure circuits. And they set in motion a series of biochemical changes that make you crave. So the interaction between stress and craving and stress and relapse and recovering addicts who are trying to stay clean is something that we actually understand at a biological level. And it turns out it's not just stress during your life. It's even stress when you are in utero. So if your mother gets stressed, if your mother is fighting off influenza, for example, while she is carrying you, you have a higher chance of being an addict when you grow up. If your mother is stressed socially while she is carrying you, you have a higher chance of being an addict when you grow up. So what are we left with here? When we understand the biology of pleasure, when we understand the interplay of genetics, early experience, and stress, it becomes clear that any one of us could be an addict. The only model of addiction that makes sense in light of the biology as a disease model, and the only attitude towards addicts that makes sense in light of the biology is compassion. And you might think to yourself, you goddamn long-haired hippie. <laughs> you brought politics into this. What about willpower? We're in Texas after all, right? Well, the thing to realize is this, that having a disease model of addiction and being compassionate towards addicts doesn't mean that you're just writing addicts a blank check. So by comparison, let's imagine you go into your doctor. Doctor says, I'm sorry to say, you've got heart disease. Do we say, 
you suck, you have no willpower, you're morally inferior, you have heart disease. No. We say, it's not your fault that you have heart disease, but now that you have heart disease, you've got some jobs, right? You better eat a heart-healthy diet, you better exercise, you better take your statin drugs, you better see your cardiologist, and if you don't do those things, it's your own darn fault, right? So what should we be saying to addicts? We shouldn't be saying, oh, you're an addict, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's not your fault, just do whatever you want, be antisocial, take the radio out of my car, it's fine, it's society's problem. No, what we say is, you're an addict. It's not your fault that you're an addict. You have something wrong with your brain, just like this other guy had something wrong with his heart. But now that you know that you're an addict, you have some responsibilities. We know that craving is stress-triggered. So you need to engage in stress reduction strategies every day. You need to get into treatment. You need to identify the triggers for your addiction. Like if you always get high around these people, or in this bar, in this place, or listening to these music, you've got to avoid those things. If there are drugs available, and there are a few of them now to reduce cravings, you should take them. You should be in treatment. And if you're not doing those things, it's your own damn fault, right? It's not a disease-based model and compassion-based model of addiction is not, is not a free ride.